Tonight's chilling true story took place on September 29, 1978, in Soquel, California, when a 15-year-old beautiful young girl named Mary Vincent was hitchhiking to her grandfather's house when she accepted a ride from a complete stranger. She was then kidnapped, tortured, and maimed, and left for dead. This story is absolutely horrific and will send chills trickling down your spine. Let's dive in. Mary was born in 1963 to very stern parents, and her mom had jobs in both the military and working at casinos at the blackjack tables. Her father was a very good vehicle mechanic. She was training hard to be a great dancer when her home life started to become very unbearable as there were escalating conflicts between her parents. The divorce was imminent. She started cutting class and skipping school for secret days with her friends. Mary eventually had enough of living with her parents, so she ran off with her much older boyfriend at the time to Sausalito, California. Shortly after, her boyfriend got in big trouble with the law as he assaulted another woman. She vowed not to move back in with her mom and dad and would go around at night checking parked vehicles to get in and get a quick night's sleep. She would wake up very early in the morning and spend the day wandering around and working small jobs for food. After realizing this was not a solid plan, she made a decision to visit her grandfather in Corona, California. Choosing this option seemed like a much better life, so Mary made her way up to the highway and started to hitchhike. Back in 1978, it wasn't uncommon for people to hop in cars with strangers. This was a carefree time in the hippie era and love was all around. So Mary made a sign saying heading south and left the city. By the time she made it to the highway, she had bumped into two other people that were also hitchhiking in the same direction. The three introduced themselves to each other and started to hike together. They weren't there very long until a beat up blue van pulls over to the side of the road. His name was Lawrence Bernard Singleton and he only offered the beautiful young girl, Mary, the ride. Lawrence had mentioned that he did not have a lot of room and he could only take one hiker. The other two hikers found this very strange and warned Mary not to get into the vehicle. Mary did not see this as a threat, as he was an old man and looked very grandfather-like. Against the advice of the other hikers, she hopped in. This will be one bone-chilling ride that she will never forget. Details of Lawrence's life are very vague. He was a sea merchant from Tampa, Florida. He became an alcoholic in his early 20s and had been married twice. He had a brother named Walter who would not even let on he knew his brother existed. We can only imagine what Lawrence did to have his brother disown him. Mary being tired and eager to get on the road, this ride looked great. It started very casual. She introduced herself, lit a cigarette, sat back and relaxed. She then inhaled, took a puff and sneezed. Lawrence leans over, grabs Mary, pulls her closer to him. He puts on this evil grin and says, let's see if you're sick. He was acting like he was checking her temperature. This was Mary's first major sign that something just might not be right, as this man was a stranger, and why would he be putting his hands on her? He had crossed her boundaries. Mary had brushed off his hands, and Lawrence went back to focusing on the road. As the drive continued, there was nothing else out of the ordinary. Mary laid back and started to fall asleep. She wasn't asleep for very long when she woke up and noticed the road signs were all pointing the wrong way. She looked down and noticed there was a small stick at her feet. She bent down, picked up the stick, and demanded that Lawrence turn the van around. She was now starting to realize that this might not be the journey she was looking for. Lawrence pretended to take her concerns serious and told her he just needed to find a secluded place to use the restroom. Mary began to get a bit nervous. She still did not completely realize she was in the presence 
of a monster. He then proceeds to park the vehicle in a dark, secluded wooden spot just off the road. As the van stops, Mary gets out to stretch her legs and notices one of her shoelaces are untied. As she bends over is where her nightmare will begin. Lawrence grabs a sledgehammer, which sits on the floor in the back of his van, and hits her with one shot to the back of her skull. When she awoke, she was naked, bound, with Lawrence standing on top of her. At this moment, he grabs some homemade green alcohol, which he had saved in an old milk container, and forced her to drink it until she passed out again. He then hops back in the vehicle and drives it to a more secluded area, three miles off the beaten path, where no one would ever find them. The first thing Lawrence does is makes Mary perform oral on him. He then proceeds to Mary all through the night. Mary could not take much more. She begged him over and over to let her go, all the meanwhile asking him why. Lawrence would not answer her question as he needed to be in complete control. When the assault seemed to finally end, he untied Mary and it looked like he was about to let her go. He teases her again and asks her directly if she wants to be free. Then to Mary's surprise, he grabs the hatchet, pulls her close, and starts to hack off one of her arms. Mary screams in agony and hopes someone will hear her bone-chilling screams. It's just too bad that they are in the middle of nowhere. Mary tries her best to fight off her attacker. She is totally awake and feeling every blow. This extremely dark story is only going to go downhill from here. Lawrence, not content with the job, then proceeds to hack off her other arm. One thing Mary vividly remembers is one of her dislocated hands firmly clinched to Lawrence's body. He desperately tries shaking it off. Mary was completely alert, in total shock, and feeling every blow. He then grabs her with both hands and proceeds to lift her to a 30-foot embankment, where he takes her badly injured body and tosses her over. He then makes his way down to her lifeless body and starts stuffing her in a cold, dark culvert that is under the road. He surely thinks she will never survive and walks away. All Mary could think about was surviving this horrific ordeal, so he would never be able to do this to any unlucky soul again. This is where the story turns for Mary. With her dangling limbs, she drags herself out of the makeshift coffin this demon has stuffed her in. Mary knew she would die very quickly from blood loss, and she notices a mud puddle in the short distance. She dips her limbs in this muddy puddle to slow down the blood loss. How intelligent is that? Mary knows she is in the middle of nowhere, fighting for her survival, fading in and out of consciousness. She gets up the courage to walk three miles to the nearest highway. She had no idea where she was going, but followed the sounds of cars on the distant highway. The first car that Mary encounters is a sports car convertible with two men driving. She was naked, scared, in complete shock, arms cut off at the elbows, and bleeding all over the road. This entire time, Mary kept her limbs above her head to keep her blood and muscles intact. The occupants took one look, got so terrified, and sped off down the road. Next to pull up was a lovely couple, who were heading out of town on their vacation. They hopped out of the vehicle, grabbed Mary, and wrapped her in a beach towel. Then the race was on for the nearest hospital. The only thing she could tell them was that she was... When arriving at the hospital, doctors immediately rushed her to the operating room. This is where a miracle will have to take place. Mary eventually would receive prosthetics for both of her arms. She was told that her journey to recovery would not be easy. After stabilizing her condition, the authorities needed to use hypnosis to get her to remember the horrific details of her attacker. A professional sketch artist began to work closely with Mary to 
come up with this drawing. A neighbor to Lawrence had noticed his picture 11 days after the attack. The teamwork between Mary and the artist was spot on. This monster was now in custody. The public and media were so horrified they couldn't call him by name, so they dubbed him the Mad Chopper. Nobody wanted him roaming the streets. How could anyone do this to a beautiful child? For a short time, Mary reunites with her parents, and five months will pass before the court case begins. Now Mary gets a chance to tell her story in the court of law. She is very determined to see him behind bars. Lawrence, on the other hand, claims his innocence and says it was someone else who did the crime. In a rare moment, Mary has to walk by him in order to testify. When she does, he whispers something that is so unforgettable. He tells her he will finish the job if it's the last thing he does. But Mary is one strong person and makes sure he gets the conviction that he deserves. In court, Lawrence claims she was a cheap trick attacked by someone else. The jury didn't believe any of his fairy tale lies. It was very easy to sympathize with the little girl with hooks for hands. The judge gave him the maximum sentence he was allowed at the time, 14 years. Public outcry came once again. In 1978, under the current laws, the judge could not make the charges consecutive and showed remorse for the entire situation. Lawrence, on the other hand, caught a break. Not like today, where convictions would be stacked and he would never see the light of day. The judge had felt powerless, but life moves on for most, except Mary. The maximum he could give this monster was 14 years in San Quentin Penitentiary. While in jail, Lawrence made a lot of friends. He would assist the teachers with a lot of their duties and make friends with some of the employees. To them, he was a model prisoner after only serving a little over eight years, he would be paroled on good behavior. This, however, would come against the recommendations of his psychologist, who still deemed him to have a lot of anger and a possible ongoing threat to the general public. The parole board then tried to release him in three different cities to major public backlash. No one wanted him living in their community. Petitions were signed in each city, one being over 11,000 strong. It was unanimous. No Lawrence. In the end, a trailer was placed on the property of San Quentin where he could finish out his last year of parole. This case alone garnered so much attention, and rising from the ashes was Mary Vincent. She became a very strong advocate for victims' rights, where she inspired the Singleton Bill in California. Criminals will not be granted early release when inhumane torture is used in their crimes. A great victory for Mary, and a great victory for everyone. And this will also allow for much bigger sentences, and judges will not feel so powerless. And while Mary's attacker was still in jail, she always still feared for her safety. Frequent nightmares and a boat with anorexia was only the tip of the iceberg. It was not easy to adjust to everyday life. After the attack, she attended a school for the disabled. As soon as she finished, she quietly slipped away from town. For many years, she kept a low profile. The relationship with her family still wasn't the best. She eventually married and had two boys, although her dreams of being a dancer were shattered. She did learn to become a very good artist and proudly attended the University of Nevada. As for Lawrence, he moved back to his hometown of Tampa, Florida. His story, however, does not have a good ending for him. He moved into a small house at 7704 23rd Avenue East. His neighbors had described him as friendly and happy. He went by the name of Bill and kept his identity private. His neighbors had no idea who he really was. His doctor prescribed him a strong antidepressant, paroxetine, and on one occasion attempted to take his own life. At this time, Lawrence was officially an alcoholic. At 3.30 p.m. on February 19th, 1997, Another weird 
an extremely bizarre story is about to take place. A neighbor saw him take a female beauty into his house. The mad chopper was at it again. Lawrence, who was very drunk, had downed an entire bottle of pills. He now engaged in a major conflict with the woman. Her name is Roxanne Hayes, and she was a mother of three. Roxanne, who was thought to be hustling the streets and doing what she could to feed her family, had no idea who she was getting involved with. This party is not about to have a happy ending. With all the drugs and alcohol-fueled parties, Lawrence had forgot that earlier in the week he had hired a few painters to come over to the house and do a small job. When they arrived, they heard the screams of the young woman. While looking through this window, they noticed Roxanne in need of help. One of the painters was going to go inside to save her when his uncle recommended that they don't. The two painters jumped in their vehicle and made a beeline to the gas station looking for help. The police were called immediately. When they arrived, they knocked and Lawrence answered the door. The first thing they noticed was a huge cut on his chest. Lawrence then proceeds to lie to the police officers by saying he hurt himself cutting a turnip. This story did not fly. At this point, the phone rang, which Lawrence then casually excused himself and walked into the kitchen. At this point, when Lawrence turned around, the police followed him in. There they noticed another scene out of a horror movie. Face down, naked, and stabbed seven times, laid Roxanne six times in the body and one in the face. Her hands completely shredded as she tried to grab for the knife. It looks like Roxanne desperately wanted to live. One of those blows went through her heart and six more in the liver. For this crime, there was no turning back for Lawrence. The mad chopper will hurt again no more. By knowing Lawrence's lifestyle and patterns, one can only speculate how many countless souls lay out in the woods. Mary again would have to show up to court to testify and helped convict this monster for good. The second time around, Lawrence wasn't so lucky. He receives the death penalty but dies of cancer before he could be executed. Leading up to his dying days, he claimed that Roxanne was his fault, but the attack on Mary wasn't. Throughout this entire process, Mary Vincent has showed an extreme amount of courage and strength, not only in survival for herself, but for the rights and safety of others. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and if you see a video on your screen right now, click it. It's the next episode.